Sometimes payable is not merely a back office function for processing invoices and making payments. It is a critical function related to the ongoing viability of any organization. However, misconceptions surrounding this vital process can ultimately jeopardize the stability and success of the entire operation. Make sure you stick around until the end when we share the one myth that has come back to haunt more than a few organizations. And we've got some real life examples from companies that everyone knows and will recognize. This is another case of life being stranger than fiction. Myth number one, we don't have to worry about duplicate payments. Our ERP won't accept duplicate invoices numbers and therefore we don't have to pay duplicate invoices. I'm going to be totally honest. When ELPs first debuted this feature, I was one of the first to jump on the bandwagon and hail it as the silver bullet when it comes to guarding against the same invoice being entered into the ERP and being processed and then paid more than one time. But it hasn't worked out as expected. Let me explain. Let's start out by walking in the proverbial mile in the shoes of the professionals who process your invoices. If I were processing invoices, I'd be most concerned about entering the total amount to be paid correctly. That would be where my main focus would be. I'd also want to make sure I got the PO number, the purchase order number, correct. There are two reasons for this. First, it would help me send the invoice to the right person for approval. And then second, it would allow me to do the three-way match to ensure accuracy of the payment. Also, I'd then be able to extinguish the purchase order once I had finished processing the invoice. To be honest, getting the supplier's invoice number would be a very low priority for me. I'd key it in, but I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about it as it would not impact my workflow at all. So, the first reason this myth falls apart is that it only works if the invoice number is keyed in correctly to start with the first time around. I could go on more about this, but I'll spare you. Suffice it to say, there are more than a few problems with getting that invoice number entered correctly, more than you might imagine. But the unexpected reason this myth falls apart has to do with what happens when the invoice number is entered correctly two times. You would think that when the processor got a notice that the invoice number had already been used, a light would go off and they'd think, hmm, this might be a duplicate. Um, but, but in reality, that is not what happens many times. Many, but to be fair, not all, think, hmm, some idiot entered this invoice number incorrectly before, and now it's keeping me from processing my invoices. So they add a blank space or a dot or a letter to the invoice number, and it is accepted and all is good, and they go on with their work. Now, if you're raging, why would they do this? I can come up with two very good explanations. Well, two explanations. I don't know if they're good or not. The first is that they have run into this situation a number of times, and every time they investigate, it turns out, yes, somebody has entered the wrong invoice number for a different invoice, and the invoice they are processing is indeed the first copy. Or two, this is one people don't often think about, they are being measured on the number of invoices they process each day. And if they stop to investigate, their productivity numbers will plummet. Moving on to our next myth, myth number two. It doesn't matter if we make a duplicate payments, our suppliers will ret return the money or give us a credit. At the end of the day, we won't be out any money. Now, let's take a look at reality. A few of your suppliers will absolutely return the funds, either by not cashing the check or returning it to you. But this number is very small indeed. A good chunk of them will issue you a credit memo. This is fine, but then the focus shifts to your operations where there could be a few issues that prevent you from getting that credit. They include issue number one, your AP employees have not been trained adequately, adequately on credit memos, so they don't recognize it. They either file it away, which amazingly is the best case scenario in this situation, or they think it's an invoice and they pay it. Yes, this happens. So everyone listening should make sure their staff recognizes credit memos and knows how to handle them, especially with your new employees, because sometimes they won't, they won't know. Issue number two, the credit memo doesn't come directly to accounts payable. Most likely it goes to purchasing. They may not recognize it either. In that case, if they don't recognize it, they may throw it away or file it. Or they may think that accounts payable was copied and so they discard it. They don't think they need to send it to you. Best case scenario, they forward it to AP. But as you can see, there are many places where this can go wrong. 
can go wrong. But that's not all that can happen. In a few cases, and for your sake, I hope only of you, a few of your suppliers fall into this category. A few suppliers will quietly pocket the money and never tell you about it. If you request a statement showing all open activity, some of these guys will ignore your request, or if they do honor it, they'll produce a statement that suppresses all open credits, and you'll think you don't have any credits with them. Think this doesn't happen? Check your own ERP and see if that's an option. There's only one reason this feature would be included in ERPs, and that's because some customers have requested it. But even that is not the worst case scenario. A few suppliers will pocket the funds as described and then try and take further advantage of you. They will realize that your processes aren't perfect and try to get you to double pay again. They'll increase the number of times they send a second or third copy of that invoice hoping to trick you, and they'll do it over and over again with each invoice. And let's face it, even if they're successful only a small percentage of that time, that's money right off your bottom line. And by the way, most companies have a few suppliers who fall into one of these two last categories. That's the real reason you need to have strong internal controls around both your invoice processing and your payment process. Don't assume you've got all great suppliers. Nobody does. Myth number three, our employees would never steal from us. This is 99 and three quarters percent true. The problem is that tiny, tiny percentage can absolutely demolish a company if a theft goes on long enough. Let me give you a few real life examples. Example number one, most recently the Jacksonville Jaguars, the football team, was $22 million over a period of four years when a mid-level trusted employee figured out how to exploit the organization's virtual card program. He was able to make purchases and then falsify accounting records to cover up this massive fraud. The weakness? The problem in this case is that he was the only employee handling all facets of the program, so there were no appropriate internal, internal controls and definitely no appropriate separation of duties. Example number two. This case involves a company that is not a household name, although I suspect you'll recognize some of its clients, and you may even have some of its products in your home. Round Hill Furniture provides furniture to Wayfair, Overstock, Kohl's, Walmart, and Ashley Furniture. In this case, an employee stole $27 million over the course of four years. The weakness? He was the only person responsible for payroll and payroll tax. He moved company money into his own investment accounts and from there he could spend it as he wished. His actions went undetected because he submitted false bank and financial statements to company leadership. Lack of appropriate separation of duties is the prime culprit here. Also, if someone in management had been receiving those statements instead of having them go directly to the employee, the fraud might have been caught earlier. One other thought, if the employee knew the statements were going first to management, he might have been deterred from embezzling in the first place. One last thought before moving on to the next example. Whoever in management received the statements is not likely to, be, to review them, let's be honest, but at a minimum, they should open the envelope so it looks like they are checking. Both of the examples prove that employees are best positioned to know where the weaknesses in your processes are and to take advantage of them. So strong internal controls across the board. Example number three, most recently, former Doylestown Hospital employee pleaded guilty to embezzling more than 600,000 from a hospital charitable account. She changed the mailing address on the account from the hospital's address to her own. Almost a year after her, her retirement, the hospital's board of directors began receiving insufficient fund charges on an account that they believed was inactive. And this set off the investigation in which they finally uncovered the fraud. In each of these quest cases, the employee in question was a trusted employee. It brings up the issue that internal controls need to be across the board. There should be no exceptions, no matter how loyal you believe the employee to be. A few more points. In general, when it comes to fraud, as you can see from the examples that I shared, men steal more, i.e. larger amounts, than women. Also, men are more likely to be the culprit in a fraud with one big exception. Women are more likely to embezzle than men. Why? because they are more likely to hold 
lower, lower level jobs with access to the money and their bosses trust them. 80% of all bookkeepers are women. More women work in payroll, accounts payable, and other lower level transactional accounting positions. They simply have more access. I will remind you of something that my colleague Kelly Paxton, a certified fraud examiner and queen of hashtags likes to say. She says, hashtag trust is not an internal control. I find these stories fascinating and apparently so does Hollywood. They've made a number of movies about some of the more bizarre frauds. We did a short roundup on some of those which maybe you have not encountered and you can watch that roundup right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Stay safe.